Hi. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to be going through a uh, <coughs> uh, be kind of beginner's guide to Linux kernel development. So if you've ever been curious about contributing to the upstream Linux kernel but haven't quite known where to get started, hopefully this will be uh, useful to you. Uh, so my background is in embedded software development, so I've spent a bit of time mucking around at the Linux kernel level, So, um, but despite that, I've only got a handful of upstream commits to my name. Uh, so I kind of, I know enough to almost know what I'm talking about, but I still make a lot of um, very dumb newbie mistakes that I'm going to go into in more detail. Um, so the kernel development process revolves a, a lot around the Linux release cycle and the upstream maintainers have got into a fairly good rhythm where they release a new kernel version roughly every 10 weeks or so. Uh, in that process what happens is they'll, there's an initial merge window where basically all the new development gets applied um, and that's coming in the form of uh, get merge requests from the, all the various subsystem maintainers. And so each kernel version has roughly 13,000 uh, commits going into it. Uh, and they, the bulk of them get applied in this two week window. Um, and then the rest of the time is spent uh, uh, producing release candidate builds, testing them, raising regressions, uh, fixing the bugs. And while this is all going on, there's still uh, new development uh, continually building up, ready to go into the next merge window. So it's a bit of a balancing act that they do, where if they spend too long fixing the regressions, then they just get more pain the next time around with the merge window. So once all the very worst of the regressions are fixed, then they normally branch, uh, release the, the kernel version, and uh, create a stable branch uh, in a separate stable repo that's uh, looked after by a separate maintainer. Uh, and the bug fixes will continue to go into that stream. It'll be a new stable version every week or so. And each of those releases has like a uh, hundred or more um, bug fixes going into it. Um, so all this is really possible due to the subsystem maintainers in the um, in the Linux community and the exceptional job that they do. Uh, so there have been some very smart people working on the Linux kernel and they've come up with some very clever and elegant design solutions, uh, which means that the code is fairly uh, independent and modular. And so you can divide and conquer and split it up and have uh, different people looking after different areas of code. Uh, so when you send a patch upstream, you're not sending it directly to Linus, you're not going to get uh, trolled on the, on the mailing list. You're sending it to a subsystem maintainer um, and they might send it on to another maintainer who looks after a, a larger subset of code and eventually it, it makes its way into the master uh, kernel branch. Um, and so all up there's uh, about 300 of these uh, different kernel repos that are in, in use by the various maintainers. Uh, some of them have two, so one for bug fixes going into the stable branch and one for new development going into the, the next, next uh, merge window. And the details of all this are in the kernel source code and uh, there's a maintainers file that lists all the mailing lists of maintainers and uh, uh, the git trees that they use. Um, the other one thing to point out is there is a repo called Linux Next, uh, which isn't really a traditional Git repo, but it sounds like a logical place to get started. Um, but it's a, yeah, it's a bad idea to use that because it gets recreated from scratch every single day by merging 300 odd uh, Git repos together. Uh, and it's mostly just used for integration testing and uh, finding problems ahead of the, the merge window. Um, so the basic kernel development process looks like any um, open source project really, it's uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, so I'll go over these steps in a bit more detail and uh, point out all the embarrassing mistakes I've made so you don't have to repeat them. Um, 
one thing I won't be covering is embedded uh, software development, uh, which follows the same process, uh, but some of the steps are different. Like, so you have to uh, cross-compile when you're building, and uh, yeah, it's a bit too complicated to get into. Um, so the first question is, which one of the 300 odd Git repos do you actually want to use? Uh, so if in doubt, it's best to use the stable um, repo. So um, <coughs> that will give you a fairly solid and reliable base from what from which to work from. So uh, if you come across any like weird problems in there, probably of your own doing rather than somebody else's weird problem um, that you picked up by accident. Uh, if you're just interested in testing the latest kernel, then use Linus's um, repo. And if you're doing new development, then you hopefully know what area of code you're working in, and there'll be a, a relevant maintainer um, subsystem tree that you can use. Uh, so once you've cloned the Linux repo, you've just got uh, 25 million lines of C code. Um, and on any given laptop or phone, you're not going to be running all that code. You're going to be running a, f you know, a few million lines of it. Uh, so the system that allows us to uh, exclude all the drivers and features that we don't care about is called uh, kconfig. And kconfig is a series of configuration options which uh, they end up as CF defs and they get used by um, the make files to work out what drivers to compile and which ones to ignore. Uh, and at compile time, the configuration options that are used by your current build are determined by a plain text file called .config. And that lives at the top of the source code tree, but it's not under source code control, uh, so you have to generate it yourself. Uh, if you don't have that file present or it's out of date, then as soon as you hit make, uh, the build system will start prompting you with uh, questions. Do you want to enable this feature? Yes, no. Uh, for each of the config options that it's not sure about. Um, <coughs> so there are over 16,000 different kconfig options in the kernel. So if you don't have the file present, uh, and speaking from experience, you'll be hitting um, like yes, no prompts for, for quite some time. Um, so the simplest way to, to generate this file is just to use the same config options that were used for the kernel that you're currently running. Um, so they're still present in a slash boot uh, a directory on your system. So you can just copy those and reuse those. Um, the problem with this is your the kernel that you're running is already out of date. So there's already been a bunch of uh, new kconfig options uh, added. So you have to initialize those as well. So the simplest way to do this is run the second command, uh, make menu config. Uh, so that brings up a menu-based uh, configuration system, uh, which allows you to toggle the di various different options, but you don't have to do anything. If you just save and exit, then it's initialized all the defaults for you to something sensible. Um, so that's the most complicated part of the whole process. Um, once you've done that, you're you're, you know, you're good. Uh, so then you just hit make. Uh, there's a lot of code com to compile, so it's best to use make-j with the number of cores on your system. Uh, one pitfall here is don't use make-j with no arguments, because um, that just turns the build into a giant fork bomb, which completely locks up your machine. Uh, and there are some uh, build pack packages that you need to install before the build will succeed, but they're um, pretty straightforward. And then once you've compiled it to install the new kernel, um, it's just a couple of commands to run, um, make install, and then uh, the next time you reboot, it will start running your new kernel. Um, so part of the reason this is so simple is if you're running a distro like Ubuntu, it comes with an install kernel script, which does some of the work behind the scenes, so it updates uh, grub to use your new kernel. Uh, if you don't have uh, that script present, then you might have to do some steps here manually to, to update your bootloader. Uh, yeah, so you when you do a make install, you haven't, you shouldn't have overridden your, your current kernel image. Um, 
your old kernel and your new kernel uh, exist side by side. Uh, so you, the it's worth uh, fam familiarizing yourself with how to to roll back if um, something terrible goes wrong with your new kernel. Um, so via the bootloader, know how to select your your old um, kernel image if it doesn't boot up. Uh, and yeah, be nice to your IT staff at work and don't do it on a work machine. That's what VMs are for. Um, so if you're using a VM, then all the, the process is just the same. So you clone the code inside the VM and do the make inside the VM and then make install replaces the uh, uh, image that the VM will use next time it, it reboots. Uh, so testing it, if you're using a VM, uh, be generous. It, it needs a lot of RAM and disk space. Uh, yeah, if you run out of these things, then the kernel just like doesn't boot. Um, it doesn't doesn't really tell you, give you a nice uh, message why. Um, and yeah, giving the VM multiple calls will uh, speed things up. Uh, the other thing is your when you're running the new kernel, you're suddenly jumping from say a 4.18 kernel to 5.2. And all your user space packages and apps and libraries are, uh, have been built for a, a much older kernel. And so they won't be particularly happy with that change. Uh, usually uh, you get the UI just uh, locking up. Uh, so Ubuntu has uh, some uh, upstream, some mainline kernel packages that track against the, the latest uh, master kernel and also all the versions in between. So you can install those. Um, fairly easily, and they should sort out problems with the, with the UI. Um, but it's worth uh, knowing the shortcut keys to drop to the shell and um, yeah, get, get your second uh, shell and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so that's basically building and running the kernel. Uh, so if you've got a patch that you now wanted to get upstreamed, um, so there's a lot of documentation on how to do that. It's um, worth reading up on it. Uh, it's all it's all online, or you can find it in the source code itself. So there's good uh, detailed information on how to uh, the coding style and how to post patches upline, um, upstream. Uh, yeah, the maintainers uh, get a lot of. Um, get a lot of uh, patches, so some mailing lists have 500 emails a day, so it's worth uh, taking the effort to make sure your patch is as clean and tidy and, and correct as possible before uh, sending up stream. Uh, there's a couple of handy scripts that you can use at this point, so one checkpatch.pl, uh, you can run it on your patch file and it just tells you if you've made uh, any dumb mistakes, like if you've got a signed off tag or uh, your formatting's um, not quite right. Uh, so I thought that I followed the process to the letter, but every time I run check patch, it always finds some, something I've gone done wrong. Um, the other one that's handy is uh, get maintainer, which uh, tells you who to send, you, send your patch off to based on the code that you've changed uh, and what mailing list to use. Uh, and the other, the other step that's useful is uh, Checking the Git tree that your maintainer is actually using, and checking that your patch applies to that, and it still compiles and everything before before you send it off. Uh, so you can only send patches to the mailing list using Git send email. Um, you can't send those attachments or anything. Uh, I'd never used Git send email before, and found it a bit of a pain in the ass to to use. Um, so. The first problem I, I did was I um, I didn't set it up properly, uh, so I skipped the those uh, some of those configuration steps, and um, it still looked like the email was getting through to my Gmail, but it was completely unauthenticated, and the mailing list um, just completely ignored it. Uh, the second problem was when <coughs> Git send email set talks about TLS, it means start TLS, uh, and my mail server was using two different ports for that, 
so when it was trying to connect, it was uh, trying to use the wrong port and nothing was happening and it wasn't giving me a, a, a useful uh, error message. Uh, so what one thing I thought was going wrong was uh, the some of the documentation online says that if you don't specify your password in the git config, which I didn't want to do because it would be stored in plain text, um, that git send email will default to a password of an empty string, which seems like a, a terrible default to use. Uh, so yeah, that's not the case. It will, if you don't specify your password, it will prompt you. It does something sensible, but uh, for a while that was uh, confusing me. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's the basic process. Uh, if you want, uh, yeah, if you're interested in uh, contributing to the Linux kernel, um, it's worth reading all the documentation. There's there's a lot of uh, good documentation there on on how to do development, how to contribute, um, just software development in general. Um, there's a free uh, online book, uh, Linux in a Nutshell, um, written by one of the kernel maintainers. Um, and that kind of goes over similar sort of materials to what I've covered, but probably explains things a lot more clearly. Um, and there's a newbie, kernel newbies uh, site that has some tips on uh, where to get started. Uh, there's also a challenge that some of the kernel people came up with a few years ago where they, they set a series of tasks where you got, if you completed all 20 tasks then you'd be pretty much a fully fledged kernel developer. So that's not running anymore but you can find the, all the tasks online so you can just uh, com complete them in your own time. Um, yeah, but the general advice, uh, rather than trying to find uh, a typo or white space problem to fix, is to just build and test the latest kernel and, and re report any bugs that you find, and that's the best way to contribute. And if you do that, you'll sooner or later you'll find a, a bug that you'll be able to fix yourself and um, get your hands dirty that way. Um, the other thing is there's a lot of new development constantly happening with the kernel, so uh, you can just find an area of code that interests you and um, yeah, get started that way. Uh, yeah. What, what sort of things were, were your fixes related to? Uh, so I had a couple in the, um, it was your Ethernet port. Um, so when you do shut down, uh, it doesn't actually physically link the port down. Right. So there's new new kind of support added to actually power off the, the port so the LED goes off and that sort of thing. So, uh, but there's a bug in that, so I fixed that. Uh, and another one was related to the uh, IP stack. So uh, VRF support um, didn't work quite r right for a particular type of UDP traffic, so, yeah. Anyone could do it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Yeah, I, I've, I don't really know. I guess you'd uh, fight it out on the on the list probably. But uh, the the problem is, um, you you well, you're probably going via the same maintainer. But there'd be cases where you kind of go and via different maintainers and different Git repos, and so you wouldn't find out about the conflict until later when you actually go to merge. And that's part of why that uh, Linux Next uh, repo is there to kind of pick up. Things like that immediately. What's that, sir? Yeah, it would probably happen. What the, I mean, the maintainer would probably make the decision and be like, oh, "I like this patch better. I'll play that," and then you have to go off and rework your change to to work in. <laughs>
Yep. Yep. Two two hundred and ninety eight Git repos goes through and merges. I'm not I'm not sure what the um how how that works with scripting and stuff, but um yeah. Do you know there are any uh NetBSD or FreeBSD kernel developers here in New York? No idea, sorry. Thank you very much.